Okay, so I have been super excited to hear from these panelists. These are our lawyers, and they are held here to help us understand how they are working to hold organizations accountable when they discriminate against women. So also working on ways to go after those organizations that are setting up policies and rules that are inherently unfair or even dangerous to women. Um, specifically sports related, this time exclusively, but uh, there is danger even in sports. <laughs> so today in this panel we are going to talk about Title IX. We're going to provide some history and background and talk about where we are today with respect to the landmark law that passed, or legislation that passed 50 years ago. We are also going to talk about what a woman or girl can do in an instance that she faces discrimination or abuse. How um, does someone go about finding a lawyer if you need one? Um, what if you can't afford a lawyer? How do I know I have a valid case? What kinds of cases are in process right now? What does the future look like? Where are we hoping they will go? How will things change um, by force of law and in the courts? And also, what is the plan to make sure rules and regulations are fair to women from the legal standpoint? How are we going to use the legal system to help ensure that women receive the respect and representation they deserve? It's an awful lot for me to ask of these panelists to solve today, isn't it? <laughs> but let's see what they can do. So today, here we have with us, um, I have Jim LaRue, James LaRue. Um, he has been practicing law for 35 years. He is from my hometown, Iowa City, Iowa. He has been general counsel and chief of staff to the governor of Iowa and owns his own law practice. Jim, um, I believe, undergrad University of Iowa? Oh, undergrad was Harvard and law school was University of Iowa. I had them mixed up. So um, thank you for being here with us today. So Jim has a very cool story about actually winning a landmark Title IX case that he's going to share with us later. Next we have Nancy Hogshead Maycar. I think most of us here are familiar with her, but um, I'm still going to introduce her anyway. She's two-time Olympic team member, three Olympic golds, one silver, and the CEO of Champion Women, where she has just been a fierce advocate for women and girls in sports on all fronts, whether it's facing sexual abuse and discrimination, or unfair treatment, and she is a Title IX mega person. <laughs> so we are so grateful to have uh, Nancy joining us today to help enlighten us. Yep. Um, and then next we have Chelsea and Christy Mitchell. Uh, Chelsea is one of these young women just absolutely made of steel who is taking on the forces that be trying to silence women. She's one of the Connecticut runners involved in litigation and her mother is here. The two of them are going to um, shed some light on what it's like to be part of litigation that goes on for years and how what, the, what their story is. It's, Fascinating. I hope you all will enjoy it. And then, of course, we have Christiana Kiefer, who is, um, you are their lawyer, right, for the case, right. So Christiana is a senior counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom. She's a litigator. She's been there for the last 10 years. And um, she's going to talk to us about the court case, some specifics, how they're trying to take people on where that court, where that case is right now and where it's headed, what other things are um, in the landscape. She was, I hope I get this right, um, you were the first person to file a federal lawsuit on the basis on Title IX for this issue where women are being forced to compete against males, correct? Yes, and unfortunately one and only. So please jump in and join us. <laughs> All right, with that we'll get started. James gonna, or Jim's going to give us a little background on Title IX. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you. I spend most of my time in county seat courtrooms in the state of Iowa, and one thing I try to do is not to ever underestimate uh, the capacities of my jury. This is difficult here after listening to the intelligence of the conversation with this group. Uh, even as early as this morning at about 4 a.m., I was trying to rewrite some of my remarks because I thought my original draft didn't give enough credit to the crowd. And at the same time, I've had enough conversations 
to feel that a little basic information about Title IX uh, what might be helpful. Now, I concede the expertise to Nancy and to others. I'm not going to try to cover the whole law, uh, but I did want to give at least some perceptions of the law that I think make it unique. I've litigated under other federal civil rights statutes over the course of 35 years, and uh, this case that I'll talk about later under Title IX was new to me. And there are some interesting characteristics about Title IX that I thought I would share with you, uh, its history one and how it's designed, and in the course of that discussion, maybe define a few terms or put a few uh, of the terms in a context uh, that might be uh, helpful to us as we discuss uh, the law. Uh, first, uh, I uh, came of age just when Title, a, Title IX was passed. That is to say, most of the people in this audience are younger than I am, but it was passed the summer before I entered college. And quite literally, I and my classmates, and I observed uh, that was uh, the first year that women were allowed at Harvard Yard, which was a big deal for that university. And uh, classmates of mine, I had a, a recent uh, forum that I sponsored as a part of our 45th anniversary, where I, my expertise by this to some degree was Title IX. Their expertise was they'd lived it. Uh, how do you live in a university even before there are real rules? And they were literally bargaining for things like, do we have a bake sale or can you give us money to travel uh, to our next uh, athletic event? It was that uh, basic and very interesting. But June 23, 1972 was remarkable uh, for what happened for the next 50 years. And I think it affects uh, what has happened in Title IX, and I'll try to explain why. Uh, on that morning of that day, Richard Nixon, who was then president, met secretly in the Oval Office and planned uh, the cover-up of the Watergate break-in, which that morning's meeting led to articles of impeachment that caused him to resign. He left that room then to go in a very public way to sign uh, the amendments to the 1972 education amendments. Title IX was there. Interestingly, if you look to the newspapers of record, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, not one newspaper noted anything about Title IX, what we're talking about today. Uh, they focused on other things, and the White House Press Initiative focused the public's attention on the fact that it would prohibit the use of federal funds to bus children for desegregation purposes. Uh, Title IX was uh, almost an afterthought, and even if you looked at the language of the, uh, of the act, and I'm sorry, I can't, do I just push the button? How do I, oh, this, this? All right, thank you. Uh, I, I am a Luddite, among other things. Excuse me if I uh, uh, get the technology not right, because we have such wonderful organization here on that level. Uh, but Title IX uh, is interesting for a no, number of reasons, uh, because it really makes no mention of, of the things that we're here for today. Uh, the original title, and the reason it was written is because people realized that we had federal law that covered workplace discrimination, we had laws that covered public accommodation discrimination, but no law that covered discrimination in educational settings. And so this seemed like reasonable law, and as the law does, and we're talking about tensions in the law even today, uh, the law has a way of borrowing language and concepts from one area and transposing it on another. And so some of this language was literally taken from existing statutes and then placed into an educational environment. And, and key words here uh, of the statute was that uh, there shall be no person in the United States shall be on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving financial, federal financial assistance. 37 words are what really turn the world. Uh, in a room like this full of bright activists, uh, there is an understandable tendency, and it's a good one, uh, to look to see how far yet we have to go. Uh, one of the perceptions I have uh, watching 50 years under Title IX in educational environments in a place like Iowa City, which has a major university, is how far we've come. Uh, I came with my wife, Mary, today, who is a pediatrician, and of my generation, she was one of the very few number of her medical school class. She's a pediatrician. Now more than 50% of the uh, uh, participants in the entering class in medical school at the University of Iowa are women. 
that's one measure of progress. It's not the whole thing. And we're not here to talk about the wide sweep of Title IX, which is what the intent of the law was, uh, but uh, sports. I understand that. But part of, I think, having agency, thinking I can do something about the world to make it better, some of that can come from looking past and see how much progress has been made. And I think of that as much looking backward as I do uh, forward. But for the first three years, there were no rules that applied particularly to sports. And one of the few uh, very unique characteristics, I think, about this federal law is what it hasn't done over the years. It's the typical federal legislation where Congress sets out some general precepts, and then that law is assigned to the appropriate federal agency who fills out those uh, initial precepts with federal regulations. And uh, the federal law uh, applied to regulations, the Federal Administrative Procedure Act, gives at least minimum kinds of requirements for how a federal agency establishes those laws. And uh, that wasn't done until an agency was set up, the Office of Civil Rights, and this was under the old uh, HEW, it's now the Department of Education, then it was Health, Education, and Welfare. And an, and an agency called the Office of Civil Rights was charged with being the body responsible for uh, publishing rules. A very un interesting thing about this law is that how few times the rulemaking uh, process has been invoked. And I think it's because all sides and the, the controversies have changed over the years. We're in the middle of one now uh, on, on the transgender uh, issue without question. There have been other controversies. In the 90s it was, could fo football programs across the country exempt themselves and have their own special classification and that caused an uproar. And every time these battles have come, there's been like a truce. I think about it, the dinosaurs we used to think about. They had all the equipment on their heads, but they never would fight. And I think somehow uh, everyone knows that there's something to gain by a battle, but more maybe to lose. And as a result, we have not used, the nation has not used, the normal self-governing rules of uh, administrative rules in order to flesh out the meaning of Title IX. Uh, very rarely, the act of the Biden administration now to address this that is happening just as we meet on the 50th anniversary ought not to be confused for something that this agency regularly does. It's a rare event, for better or for worse. And you can feel the energies in this room. There's a lot to lose if you make the wrong move, right? There's a lot to lose, and both sides feel that. And it's one reason we haven't done this. So what have we resided on uh, instead? It's an agency uh, subject to the will of whoever is president, because presidents end up naming who's head of OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, but a cacophony of inscrutable, uh, like the Wizard of Oz, putting out missives to educational institutions, and they come in a wide variety of names, such as dear colleague letters, policy interpretations, clarifications, guidances, and one hardly knows what they mean from time to time, and yet they have uh, the feel of law, and so people try to follow them, but the problem is they don't have stability because they're not like administrative rules. And so when you have a new president, they can be turned on a, on a dime. And an interpretation by OCR uh, made on an important issue uh, uh, can suddenly change the contours and the enforcement of the law. I'll give you an example. When George W. Bush uh, became president, uh, they weren't in favor, and those constituents who supported that administration weren't all that much favorably disposed to enforcing Title IX. So they pointed to an area of the law that said, if you just got uh, a survey of the interests of the student bodies, uh, that should be enough to determine what sports to do, a really, uh, a really flimsy way to enforce Title IX. Well, that was changed as soon as you had a new president, and you can do that almost instantly if you have the will to do it, because you don't have to go through the rulemaking process. So we have this inscrutable galaxy of these informal documents informal to the extent that they were approved without much public discussion, not public education, not a consensus of how we want to govern ourselves, but the recipients of these letters, which are often the, those educational institutions that receive federal funding with the threat if they violate the law, they can lose all federal funding. That's the hammer, and it's the only hammer in this law. 
And so the stakes are high, the words are sometimes inscrutable, the documents are informal, and there you are. Well, in this unusual atmosphere, how is it that we have governed ourselves to, my view is, one of the most successful laws in carrying out its purposes in the last 50 years. And also, I mentioned Watergate. The other context is that it's happened with a precipitous drop in public confidence in federal government. When Nixon was president, depending on the survey, between 60 and 70 percent of Americans had confidence that the federal government could do its will competently. Now it's into the low 20s. It's, it's a very concerning thing if, if you believe in self-government. How in the world did you have such success in implementing a federal law in an atmosphere where the public's interest and support of federal government has fallen to record levels? Here's how it's happened, and I think it gives some clues as to what's going on. Uh, first of all, you have had some institutional players, informal, but they've had some effect on college campuses. It's, uh, you know, the coordinators, the Title IX coordinators are there. Two, you have had OCR occasionally doing investigations, and that raises the level of awareness on university campuses. Three, and this is terribly important in light of the discussions we've been having, to a disproportionate and I think successful degree, the role of advocacy groups has been astonishing. You've had one brilliant generation after another of female advocates forming groups, forming coalitions, finding ways to keep the law going, notwithstanding the absence of firm regulations. And what I see happening today and what I find most exciting, it's like history is recreating itself. I don't know where it's headed, but to have people with diverse views representing diverse groups is a part of the core of the energy of Title IX that's been here for 50 years. The forms change somewhat, the people change, but the ethos of the bill is what makes it so successful. And then finally, finally, you have the role of the federal courts. Uh, what is most unusual to me about Title IX when I compare it to other federal statutes is the direct access that litigants have to the federal courts. If you have a complaint of, made by a client, for example, in the workplace discrimination under Title VII, you have to first file a complaint with a federal agency, maybe cross-file with the state agency, the EEOC. Almost every claim that I've filed there gets smothered like a baby in a crib. It's, it's a large organization that to me seems indifferent. It's a conservative institution that snuffs out more claims than inspires them. And here, whether it was an omission of Congress on a bill that nobody noticed when it was passed, or whether it was an act of genius, I do not know. But what I do know is that you don't even have to file a letter to complain to the institution. You can go right, although I think as an advocate you should because it's a great exhibit when you file a letter with the institution and they ignore you. But here we go, the, you go right to the courts. And what we have had in the 50 years of our, it doesn't matter whether they're appointed by Republican or Democrat, in our system of justice, I think so highly of our federal courts, they are smart people, and thankfully there are more women judges in the last 50 years, but even those who are men, by this time in 50 years, most of them have daughters. Most of them have family members who are female who have experienced the glass ceiling in one aspect of life or another. And what we have on the whole is a series of brilliant federal ju judicial opinions that are somehow looking at these informal documents and making sense of them, finding words because this is what judges do and putting them into a coherent whole. And in part of the miracles of the act, I think, are that we have a federal judiciary that is ready to react to the bill that on the whole has been there just when we've needed them has made this a law different than any other that I've practiced under. You have to be ready, and then you are ably supported because this has happened to over 50 years. You have people like Nancy. These advocates that I talked about, there's a bevy of world-class expert witnesses that make us lawyers some days look good. And I'm grateful for that. So 
I, I won't go into more detail. You'll, you'll, you'll have it from Nancy, but the institutional kinds of, of pieces that make this uh, area of the law uh, with the few amendments, one have happened three years after the bill was passed, which included, and I'll close with this because this is where we are. After three years, OCR passed its first rules, and here's where sports comes in. It says, listen, that the words are carefully construed to be parallel to the statute that you've read, but to be inclusive of sports because it was entirely forgotten in the original bill. So this rule, this regulation passed, which is still controlling law today, says no person shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, be treated differently from any other person or otherwise be discriminated against in any interscholastic, intercollegiate club or intramural athletics offered by a recipient and no recipient shall provide any such athletics separately on such basis. Litigation going forward starts there. It includes references to OCR rulings. It includes references to brilliantly written federal judicial opinions, and it's only in the federal courts that this law is enforced. It's never buried in state courts. And then we move ourselves forward one step at a time. Thank you. The coalitions that we build as part of trying to make the world a better place are what gives meaning to life. I think so many of us want to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Um, I do a lot of work, but one thing I don't do is put on conferences. When, I'm, when I met Kim, I was like, you know, it's just such a great synergy. So, um, and it, it's allowing what I've been doing to be so much bigger than it was. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with Jim LaRue at Univer for University of Iowa. <clears throat> I'm gonna actually be um, talking about Title IX and case law from the perspective of somebody who has not been to law school, okay? So I'm gonna be talking to you all about um, how Title IX, or how we measure athletics, and then exactly what would be wrong if the, if the Biden administration has its way, all right? So where I'm going is, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of this history. To me, it's very clear, but, but uh, to Jim, maybe not so much. Um, all right, I'm very easy to find. I just had somebody call me and say, hey, we can scrub your information from the web. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so um, I run a nonprofit, Champion Women, started in 2014. This is sort of my believe me statute when I tell you uh, the kinds of things that we do. We provide the legal advocacy for girls and women in sports, okay? So that's our, that's our, our specialty. Um, I did write the book Equal Play. It, com it um, talks about through history about how the three branches of government have worked together or not to make Title IX be able to happen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I do a lot of expert witness and, and uh, here Sports Illustrated named me as one of the unrelenting. Okay, okay. So before I tell you about, <laughs> before I tell you about so you can tell I use my hands a lot. Before I tell you about, um, do you have anyone on the other thing? Oh, yeah. no? Thank you. Before I tell you about, um, um, about sort of the law and whatever, I would just want to give you an idea of where we are with equality in sports. We just finished 50 year anniversary. Um, and I, I um, there is this sense that like, yay, we did this 50 years ago and we're done. And that's just not true. So where we are today is actually these numbers are slightly old, but uh, women are being denied almost 200,000 college opportunities to be able to participate. Uh, women are now, the new number is 1.18, almost, almost 1.2 billion dollars in college scholarship dollars annually annually and 162 2 million when it comes to recruiting dollars 
So being able to get the athlete to be able to come to the school, who that really hurts are coaches who want to move up through the ranks if they don't have equal uh, recruiting dollars. But that's one of the ways that we measure whether or not a school is providing equality here. So we're already, I, I, it's a, the number is 1.3 million right now at the high school level. Girls get 1.3 million fewer opportunities. This is, has nothing to do with like girls not being interested in sports. Girls in Maine, have three times the sports opportunity that boys in Florida do. So it's not that there's nothing different right about kids. It is that Florida schools don't offer very many sports. Maine schools offer a lot. If you build it, they will come. So, all right, so we're in a position where you have schools nowhere near providing they're not meeting demand, right? There's, for, for every one kid that wants to play basketball, there are three that don't make the team, okay? And you can say that for every sport. Um, we, at, at Champion Women, I've been lecturing on this, you know, forever and ever, and in the past, I only used the bottom two lines. Can y'all see this graph? I was one, only using the bottom two lines to show how sex discrimination was, uh, changing uh, and uh, you know and I would usually say something like notice how the lines don't come together women's women's gains don't come from men's expenses and anyway but what I wasn't doing was taking into account the fact that there were so many more women who were in college so that to give one in ten men or one in ten women an equal opportunity to participate we should have been looking at that that fuchsia line at the top Okay, and that's the gap. So when I say 200,000, that's the, the gap I'm saying. But if one in 10 men or one in 10 women, more likely it's more like it's two out of every 100 that have an opportunity to be able to play sports in college. These are rare, rationed type of educational opportunity. This is not something that everybody gets to do. Um, I had a, for the, I don't know if you saw, I had somebody, a television announcer, uh, uh, who said, look, Leah got last in the 100 freestyle, so she can be beaten, what's the deal? And my, I was like, that is so profoundly insulting to women's sports, because she didn't get last, she got eighth place do you know how many women swimmers there are in the NCAA, in the higher ed? It's 13,000. She got eighth out of 13,000. Somebody, a basketball team that gets eighth in the Final Four competition, would you say, like, they got last? Would you say they were a huge failure? Oh, no, no. They just made millions for their school. They are going to be touted. A lot of them are going to go pro. For him to even say that is absurd. Okay, spoiler alert, it's getting worse. And what we do at, at Champion Women is we try to make the data that's available from the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act available to your average person. So we have a website, Title IX Schools, that shows, um, and we actually have got some glitches on it, so don't look right now because the numbers are not quite right. Uh, but we, uh, um, we, we try to show families how many, what the gap is in participation, what the gap is in scholarships, and what the gap is in how you treat the athlete, okay? And <clears throat> um, uh, so <clears throat> this, is, this is for the ACC. I want you to notice for the ACC, and remember, this is where the money is, right? These are the rich schools, and these schools uh, that also include my beloved Duke here, they need to add 1,500 opportunities for women to be able to participate. Do you know 1,500? That's like an average of four teams per school. The ACC, the rich schools, need to add $45 million in college scholarship dollars. Right? These are not small numbers of what women are already being denied. 
So those were my daughters back in the days when they were young. They're 16. They're driving. Now I hardly ever see them. But they, <laughs> but uh, when they were little, uh, so this is them when they were seven years old. They went to their third softball practice, and they said, uh, hey, Mom, how come the boys have a scoreboard and we don't have a scoreboard? How come they have dugouts and we don't have dugouts? This age, see how young that is? They know it's not equal. The college students that I talked to at University of Iowa absolutely knew that they were not getting treated the same way that the men were getting treated. But they didn't really kind of understand what their options were to be able to make, to make a difference, and that is what we do. So first of all, just real quick, if this is what, a, if this is what the women's or the men's bathroom looks like, um, is that a civil rights issue, or is it just a nasty, disgusting hygiene issue, right? A lot of times we get lots of calls on people who will say, the, the facilities are terrible, okay? And I have no idea what to do with that until you can look at what the other sex is getting, right? So if it looks like the one on the left, it is a nasty, disgusting hygiene issue. If it is the one on the right, then you know that, that they're not getting treated the same, when you look at locker rooms, the, the, that is the, the disparity between men's and women's uh, locker rooms. They, it, the locker rooms, okay, don't get me started. Okay, okay, so, so for every, this is what I was saying when I was saying we, the lawyers were up here earlier. So every court, when you go into them, they're only there to decide two issues, okay? What are the facts, car accident case? and somebody, somebody gets, uh, gets injured, the issue is, what, was the light red or green? And plaintiffs have their experts and their eyewitnesses and vice versa. So then the jury says they've heard all the evidence and they say the light was red, okay? And then questions of law, okay. Well then who gets to recover after you know what the facts are, right? Does the person who is in the, dry, in the passenger seat Get, uh, get to recover from the person who went through the red light if they get injured? Um, does the person across the street who watched this nasty, gnarly accident, do they get to be able to recover? Those are questions of law. So Title IX is unique. It's so much easier than what, what, uh, what they're having to do in that the facts and the law at this point, 50 years, are really clear. If I had my career to do over, one of the things I would do is a little, I, I worked so hard to make sure that women had the right to equal opportunities in sports. What I wasn't doing as much of that I'm doing more of now, Champion Women is doing more of now, is making sure that it actually happens, that there is enforcement, that students know what the law is, they know how to, uh, and, and, and they feel good about doing it. They feel good about uh, bringing equality to their school. You've all seen this, this is Title IX. Um, I wanna just say something real quick. You know, Title IX is based on another statute called Title VI that bars discrimination based on race, color, national origin, passed in 1964. So Title IX, all they did was it took race, color, national origin out of there and they put in the word sex. So it's the same statute. Um, what drives people a little bit crazy is, number one is I want you to notice it does say sex in there, and then two is the fact that you have this formal, official sex segregation in sport. Okay, so we've got the law, all right, that's one part of the law. Another part, uh, oh, um, so I, I mixed up my slides, sorry. <clears throat> so sports advocates have been repeating for literally 50 years, literally 50 years, saying the exact same thing. If you want to give women equality in sport, they need their own team. So long before any transgender issue or anything else, right, because most people want to know, why isn't sport like the physics department? In the physics department, who makes the classroom just... All, all it, you know, whoever has the highest SAT GPA, whoever qualifies into that department, and then it's co-ed. But athletics cannot do that for all the reasons that we heard yesterday. 
right? In order to give girls and women equal opportunities in sports, they need to have their own team. So equality requires sex segregation. I keep hearing some of the some uh, gender activists who are trying to erase um, the the, the uh, the, the differences between men and women, and if they do that, literally millions of women will lose. Millions of girls and women will lose. Okay, so back to the law, so you got the statute, then you've got the regulations, right, that Jim was just talking about, and this is like, how do you measure sex segregation? So in 1975, the Department of Education explicitly said it's okay to have um, to have sex segregation in sport, they anticipated it, and here's how we're going to measure sex, uh, uh, sex discrimination is, are you giving equal participation opportunities, scholarship dollars, are you treating them the same way? All right, then, uh, this is again part of 1975, which is um, the laundry list is how we reference it in the Title IX world. And, um, we, and we, it goes over like, how would you know if you were not getting treated the same way? So it is, it, it is um, all these metrics from um, uh, medical care, equal coaching, facilities, equipment, all of the metrics that like my daughters at age seven were saying, how come this, how come, why, how come we don't have restrooms? Why, how come the concession stand is so far away and it's right next to the boys' facility? All of those things go to, and they, the girls know that they're getting second class treatment. Um, so, but by law, they, they are entitled to equality, but they have to demand it. Okay, I'm actually gonna go, not, this has to do with whether or not, uh, I, I don't wanna take up too much time, uh, whether or not you're providing enough opportunities in sports. Um, it was in 1979, and sort of that first part of participation, um, and I'm not gonna go into that right now. But, so, let me get down here. <clears throat> Open up tennis shoes on. So, <clears throat> um, <ooh. laughs> so <clears throat> as you know, from seventh grade, we have three branches of government, and right, so this is how a statute works. So first, the, the Congress, they pass the statute, no person shall on the basis of sex. Then you have uh, the, the uh, executive branch with the Department of Education, and they go and they promulgate regulations, like Jim was saying, on uh, what it means, like how do you interpret this statute over here, okay? Sometimes people will sue and say, oh, this, your rules are inconsistent with this. Thank you. Okay, sorry. You, sometimes people will say, um, you know, the, the rules that you've created are inconsistent with this, right? And then after, after you have like, here's how we measure, then it goes over here to the courts and you'll have somebody come up and say, I'm getting second class treatment. I'm not getting equality. That's what Jim did in, so in the University of Iowa case, we educated them on here's what the law is. And then, connected them with an attorney who, you guys gotta see Jim when it comes to, when he's introducing evidence into a court, when he's uh, talking to Donna Lopiano and getting expert witness out, you know when somebody has their 10,000 hours at something? He is so good, okay? As somebody who's, you know, it's like watching, watching Sue Walsh swim, okay? When she does back, backstroke, I still watch the videos and it's just, like art. Um, anyway, so so this right this uh, happens sort of over and over again. A lot of times, like the statute will get changed or the regulations will get changed. We have remarkably steady law. So, almost three years ago now, we sent letters to every single school, every single conference in the country, showing them all the ways that they were discriminating against. Uh, girls and women. We have been responsible for many of the cases that have come forward. Um, I won't go into them, but but we we uh, we've done a lot. And um, but but here's what we're worried about: the Biden administration's his changes to the law, the administration would conflate sex with gender identity. Okay. When I first heard that, I was like, you know, 
okay. I didn't get it was conflating. I thought it was like, you know, adding on. But there are two really bad things that can come out of that. One is that if sex discrimination equals gender identity discrimination, somebody who identifies as being a woman can uh, compete in the women's category. And there, you know how the NCAA has rules? There would be no rules. Bad outcome number two, a judge could not uh, affirm formal sex segregation if it was not based. So the first one, I think we all get, right? That's exactly what happened, not only with Leah Thomas, but imagine somebody who's not been through gender-affirming hormones. Okay. But bad outcome number two is, imagine not the ACLU, not the National Women's Law Center, not all the amazing, not these groups over here that are trying to equate sex and gender identity, but other groups who really hate Title IX Think football interests, right? Think um, men's basketball interests. Think like, you know, sexism is so entrenched. Think about like they could then say, oh, it's not based on biology. It's based on something else. Well, then, you know, what women would lose is the right to equality, they, right? They would... I would think I think schools would still have women's sports teams, but would they have the right to hire Jim, go into a school, not just get the swimming team reinstated, but do more and make sure that now the facilities are equal, that the equipment, that they're traveling the same way, et cetera. They're getting the same medical care. Yeah, they would love that. If it's not based on biology, I don't know how we keep such a strong law, where right now, the facts and the law are uniquely easy to measure. They are uniquely, it uniquely requires very little of plaintiffs. Um, Jim, after you met with the plaintiffs, how, how, many, how long did, uh, or how, how much time do you think total number of hours it took from plaintiffs? Okay, okay, uh, we, yeah, okay, I'll, okay. So, so uh, anyway, so, so that's truly what I'm worried about is in this area is that if we equate those two, um, right, so there's all kinds of other issues, but that we could lose the right to formal sex segregation, right? We don't racially segregate pretty much anywhere. We don't religiously segregate anywhere. We do sports because of what we heard from uh, Ross and Emma and, and others yesterday, and, um, and Carol, uh, right? So we do formally sex segregate, and just, it is a weird space, but we need to be able to have that. We need to be able to sex segregate in sport. All right, so with that. All right, so now we're going to hear from Christiana. I'm gonna ask you, Christiana, to please tell us a little bit about Chelsea's case, would you, uh, where it stands right now. Uh, if there are uh, any other lawsuits going on in the U.S. and um, largely, <laughs> I would, I, if we need more lawsuits, just give us an update on what the current situation is, please. Sure. Well, like many of you, I first became aware of the issue of males competing in women's sports by hearing reports out of the state of Connecticut. Uh, Selena Soul, who's sitting here, middle table, I kept seeing her on TV. Kudos to Selena for her courage in speaking out. And, you know, it was, it was interesting. I had worked on gender identity issues trying to protect women's safe spaces, and we kept waiting. We kept waiting for entities that represent women um, that are involved in Title IX to take this on. And we waited, and there were crickets. And so eventually, we made uh, contact with Selena and other female athletes in the state of Connecticut, and we decided to file a Title IX complaint with the prior administration. Uh, made great progress, actually received a good outcome, but they didn't move quickly enough. So Selena was a senior, Chelsea was also a senior, and realized that for every single season, they had been forced to compete against biological males, and that was depriving them of opportunities. In Selena's case, she lost the opportunity to advance the next level of competition. Chelsea lost out on state championship titles, not once, but four different times. All New England Awards, which you all in the sporting community know is gonna be an incredible honor lost to males. In fact, over the course of four years, these two male athletes took 15 women's state championship titles 
and set 17 new individual meet records. Meet records that even today, my female athlete clients in Connecticut say, I would have been recognized as having broken a record, but that male set it far beyond what I'm able to compete at. So it's, it's still having an impact today. So in, uh, what, February of 2020, Alliance Defending Freedom became the first and to date only organization to have filed an affirmative federal lawsuit under Title IX to protect the rights of women and girls, not to be forced to compete against male athletes. It's a clear violation of the federal statute, as you heard so aptly uh, from my panelists, and we've been litigating that since February of 2020. Of course, you all know what happened in March of 2020 as the world shut down and slowed the wheels of justice significantly. Uh, it's been a, a little bit of a, it's been an interesting journey, hasn't it? Um, it's been difficult, frankly, to get uh, coverage of this issue and raise awareness of this issue up until recently. And so while, um, while it's heartbreaking to hear the stories of women who across the country have lost again and again and again, including most recently and most prominently against Leah Thomas, I am in many respects grateful for the courage of those who have been willing to and able to speak out because it's raising awareness and, and frankly we're getting greater and greater coverage of this issue because there are more and more female voices in the fight. So, well, litigating at the district level in Connecticut, as you might suspect, is not easy on this issue. Uh, in fact, the federal judge looked at us, their lawyers, and said, you are not allowed to use discriminatory and degrading language, i.e. referring to males as biological males. That was the, quote, offensive and derogatory language. In fact, we were instructed by the federal court to refer to these males as, quote, transgender females because he viewed it to be far more scientifically accurate. Of course, that violates not only, you know, my client's right um, in position in advocating for their fair and fair competition, but even as a lawyer, my ability to zealously advocate for the position of my client. So we were able to uh, sort of, I would say, negotiate with the court. And so you'll notice in our briefing, we use the term male-bodied athletes. Sounds a little bit awkward, to be quite frank, like they're not, they're not disembodied, but that's the only way that we have been able to, without violating a directive of the court, actually fully litigate our case uh, before a Connecticut judge. So that's, that's disappointing, but um, you, see, you see kind of what we're up against. Current status of Chelsea's case, the federal court, uh, in essence, dismissed their case. So he looked at the girls' lost records, lost opportunities and said, you know what, the males have graduated, so what, it doesn't really matter. You don't have a case here anymore. And that's wrong. Under Title IX, a appropriate remedy here for taking away their opportunities is to recognize Chelsea for the four state championship titles that she did in fact win as the fastest biological female in that race. Those records needs to be fixed. For Selena, acknowledging that she should have been competing in the final in the state open, the state championship event there in the state of Connecticut, recognizing her for the accomplishments that she did make. So we've appealed her, their case to the Second Circuit. We have been waiting for a year for an oral argument date. Yes, the wheels of justice can turn a little bit slowly. But what I want to emphasize on the positive side is, women, if you take nothing else away from this, Courage begets courage. And so by virtue of teen girls like Selena and Chelsea speaking out and sharing their story, they have, in some respects, launched a movement that has gotten us to where we are today. Lawmakers across the country have looked at their stories and said, we do not want to see this happen to young women in our state. We will not stand for that. And so, as Doreen and others mentioned earlier, we've seen 18 states across the country that have now passed some version of a Save Women's Sports Act. And I just want to hit on that just really briefly, Kim, because I think uh, there's been a lot of media misinformation and giving people the benefit of the doubt, perhaps haven't had the opportunity to actually read those statutes in and of themselves. They've been mischaracterized as anti-trans, and I just want to lay that to rest really quickly. These laws do nothing of the sort. We believe, and these laws make clear, that there's a place for everyone to compete in sports, period end of story, including the males who identify as female. The question is, where is it most fair for them to compete? And under each one of these laws, what they say is you can have a male sports team, you can have a co-ed team to your heart's content. 
But if you have a sports team that's designated for women or girls, only biological females compete on that team, period. So these, these sports, uh, say women's sports laws are really designed to enforce and perpetuate the purpose and promise of Title IX for female athletes that just is not happening, especially in the wake of the 2016 Obama Dear Colleague letter, which, as you know, was revoked by the subsequent administration, but is still, even now, being relied on by school districts across the country as justification for discriminating against women and allowing males to come in and dominate women's sports teams. That's in fact the justification provided by the, the schools in the state of Connecticut. So 18 states, which is really exciting. It's great to see this legislation being promulgated as Doreen also mentioned. Um, there's federal legislation being, con being considered at this point, Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. All that does is a very simple thing. It says sex under Title IX means biological sex and not gender identity, that's, that's all it does. So especially in the wake of the efforts by the Biden administration to completely reverse 50 years of advances for women under Title IX, federal legislation like the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act is a really a critical component to ensuring that Title IX continues to be interpreted and protected um, as originally designed. So, quick, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for you. So. When you say oral arguments, so first of all, when are you, are you scheduled to have those and what do they entail? What is your ex expectation from that? What is the next step? Can you just give us a little bit of a composite view? Yes, absolutely. So we are at the Court of Appeals, which is the, the middle level in federal court, and the next level up would be the United States Supreme Court. So we do not have an oral argument date yet, which is frankly quite frustrating. We've been waiting on one for a year now, um, which you know, as Chelsea continues through her NCAA career, it just you know delays and delays and delays. So once oral argument is scheduled, we'll be able to um, basically argue that what the district court did below is wrong and that the girls lost records and opportunities do matter. They are something that can be remedied under Title IX and just kind of depends on how the court rules. Um, eventually one of these cases, and I'm happy to address the other ones that are pending, will make it to the United States Supreme Court. I think we should anticipate, especially in jurisdictions like Connecticut, that there may be several losses along the way. But I am ultimately very confident especially with the current makeup of the court, that, that we can prevail, uh, but ultimately. When you're in, so when you make oral arguments, will all of you speak? I mean, will Chelsea speak at the oral arguments? Will you speak? Will scientists speak? Who will be a part of those oral arguments? Sure. Well, the district level, the entry level courts are really where the record is made. So that's where the athletes would testify. Um, in one of the cases I'm involved in in West Virginia, we have numerous experts. That's where they testify. That's the trial court level. By the time you appeal to the appellate court, it's just the attorneys that are making legal arguments based on the record developed below. So no, while they cer I ho certainly hope they're able to be there in person and observe, they would not be testifying. It would just be their attorneys representing them in court. Okay, good to know. And will you pull in expert witnesses at that point, or no? No, all that happens at the trial These level. These are words that we're all familiar with when yes. it comes to court cases, so trying to understand what a court case of this nature looks like is what sure. the picture well, I'm trying to make. I tell you what, let me, let, me talk, let me switch gears just a little bit and talk to you about some of the litigation on the Save Women's Sports Laws, if that's okay. Please. So, um, Chelsea and Selena's case is the only affirmative case in the country right now that has been filed by female athletes to secure their rights under Title IX. I hope that changes. I hope many more will be filed. The other cases that are currently pending across the country are actually defensive litigation on this question. So they are states that have passed women's sports laws to protect the integrity of women's sports, and the ACLU has filed suit to have those laws declared unconstitutional. They have, they're claiming that it violates Title IX, isn't that interesting, and equal protection to protect the integrity of the female sports category. The first suit that they filed was in the state of Idaho. They sued Idaho for its state women's sports law. 
Alliance Defending Freedom intervened in that case on behalf of two female athletes, both of whom collegiately had competed against and lost to June Eastwood. You may remember Eastwood um, rather dominated, I think he was the first NCAA uh, Division I cross country and track athlete to really rise to prominence uh, in the female category. Set records as a male that would have broken the NCAA women's records and then turned around and began competing in the female category. You may remember Madison talking about being at the NCAA Big Sky Championships, hearing Eastwood's coach yell, slow down, slow down, so as not to so overtly trounce the female competition. So Alliance Defending Freedom has intervened in that case. We are currently up at the Ninth Circuit on appeal. Case was also filed in the state of West Virginia, and that one, interestingly enough, though furthest, though filed, um, one, one of the most recently filed is actually one of the furthest along procedurally. So I actually learned just yesterday, sitting here at lunch with my clients, whoo, that trial got delayed. We were supposed to ramp up and go to trial in July on West Virginia Save Women's Sports Law. So what that looks like is the ACLU has filed on behalf of a nine-year-old boy who is on puberty blockers. And it is, frankly, one of the most heartbreaking things to see and to litigate um, what's, what's happening to this nine-year-old child who's being pushed forward into the limelight and sort of being used as a poster child for, for this issue. Um, I represent Lainey Armistead, who is a collegiate soccer player. And she's raised with brothers. She knows what it's like to compete against boys. And she's like, in my sport, there's a clear safety component, as Ross Tucker talked about yesterday, a very clear safety component to putting up Laney against a male athlete, bigger, stronger, faster, greater velocity, and they you know the list goes on and on and on. So we, uh, that case has become the case of dueling experts. So there are about eight expert witnesses, which is why the, the sport science that you heard about yesterday is really so, so, so important. We must have academic freedom such that um, experts and scientists are able to do these studies, publish these studies, make them peer-reviewed studies, so that then ca they can then actually be used in federal litigation for the protection of women and girls. So the ACLU experts, um, their basic argument is that biological sex is super unclear. Like, it's just really hard to tell. It's a combination of factors. You've got chromosomes, you've got hormones, you've got secondary sex characteristics, you've got, you know, being a girl is about liking pink, and it's about unicorns, and it's about rainbows. And I'm not making any of this up. This is in deposition testimony. Being a male is about, you know, maybe liking to wear tuxedos and, quote, being able to be president of the United States. Okay? So you see, you can see here the sex stereotypes that are being propagated by this ideology. This is what we're up against. So basically, we're bringing in experts to say sex is real. Biological sex isn't difficult to, to identify. Sports matters. Athletic advantage of the male matters. Women's safety matters. So we were slated to go to trial at the end of July. That has thankfully been postponed until January. Uh, but that will really be the first really big opportunity for female athletes to take the stand for the experts to take the stand and to develop a very full and robust record for why Title IX matters in the first place. Oh, that's fascinating, thank you. Um, I now wanna turn some questions to Chelsea and Christy. Thank you so much for being here. Um, first, I thought, Chelsea, you might wanna just give us a little background to your story. Um, let us know how this all started for you, how it unfolded, and um, what made you confident enough to want to seek litigation or help from lawyers. And then I will have your mom jump in about the path that you two took to find a lawyer. But if you could give us the background to your story, that'd be great. Yeah, is this on? Okay. So um, I competed against biological males, like Christiana said, um, all four years of my high school career. Um, <laughs> and in my junior year is when I really started um, you know, losing out on big name things. Um, kind of my freshman and sophomore year, I kind of lost out on medals or advancing to the next level of competition, but nothing um, as big as losing a state championship, which in my junior year, I lost four individual state titles to these two biological males. Um, <laughs> this was obviously very upsetting, very heartbreaking for me. Um, you know, I'd worked these two years to even get to this position, to be in the race um, to win a state championship. And so, 
you know, at the end of my junior year is when I decided to join the Title IX complaint um, with Selena and Alana, but I was anonymous um, to start, and I was very intimidated. Um, I was intimidated into thinking that, you know, I would get a lot of hate, um, that I wouldn't be able to get into college. You know, I was being recruited to colleges for Division One track, and I didn't want to jeopardize that by speaking on such a controversial topic. Um, I was also nervous, you know, what, what would that entail for my future? Would I not be able to get a job? I know a lot of administrators at these um, collegiate schools are warning athletes that they won't be able to get a job and will be, um, their opinions will be, um, you know, disregarded completely. And um, so that was a really big concern for me. Um, so that's why I was anonymous. Um, and I stayed anonymous for my entire junior and part of my senior year up until I was finished with college recruitment. Um, and, you know, you would think that losing those state championships would be enough to want to put my story out there. But um, for me, the breaking point was realizing that there was no relief for us female athletes. Um, you know, I thought maybe this Title IX complaint would, you know, go long enough that by the se my senior year, um, it would be rectified. That was not the case. Um, I also had hopes that perhaps these male athletes would f fall off or, um, well, they were in my grade, but I know that, um, you know, in some cases, Leah Thomas graduated after one year, um, but that was not the case for us. Um, so I, my going into my senior year, the male athlete that was dominating all these races had um, not competed the first month of the indoor season. Um, and when they did, their times were slower to the point that I could possibly compete with them. So, you know, that gave me a little bit of hope that perhaps, you know, I would be able to do the hard work to win against these biological males. Then the second biological male posted a top five time in the nation. You know, I'm, an, I'm a good athlete, I'm an elite athlete in Connecticut, but I was not going to post a national, nationally ranked time in that event. So I knew there was no hope. There was when I maybe thought that, you know, we could prevail in any way, I realized that that was not the case, that I would not win, um, and that there was no relief for us, except the only thing that perhaps I could do now to, you know, beat these males would be to join a lawsuit, to do it legally, to go through the courts. Um, and in my senior year, ADF came to us asking if we would want to be on a lawsuit to against the CIAC, which is the Connecticut governing body. Um, and I would not be able to be anonymous on this. I would have to be public. My name would be out there. So there, there's no anonymity that I could, um, you know, claim. Um, but I, at this point, I was done. I was done pretending that I was okay with this. You know, these males would come up and attempt to talk to me at the start line. You know, it was very, I felt like I was hiding. I felt like I was hiding that I was um, okay with this. And I was the girl losing these state championships. And so if I was okay with it, why would any of these other girls think that they shouldn't be okay with it? You know, like why would they you know, why would they speak out on this when the person who's losing doesn't care, so to speak? So, two days before our state championship, um, we filed a lawsuit. I asked ADF to file it before my state championship so that I could walk in there knowing that I did everything I could to beat these males. Wow. Christy, can you, thank you so much, Chelsea. Christy, can you share a little bit about the experience from a mother's side and then how you were able to, I mean, I personally know, like dinner conversations, I want to know how you were able to encourage her to take a stance and be supportive. I know it's hard when your daughter is going through something difficult to feel like, can they handle more? And so the... I just I would love for you to share what the conversations were like, what your journey was like, um, and the, how you tried to reach out and support your daughter and the other runners. Sure. So that that was hard to listen to, even now after living through this. Um, you know, this started for us in 2017, so five years ago. Um, I watched Chelsea run her first state championship against a male athlete, and 
um, you know, I've, it kind of echoes what some of some people said yesterday. I, I thought that it would get fixed, right? After that first season, I was like, they're not going to let this stand. The coaches are going to speak out. Somebody's going to do something. This won't continue. But it continued. Um, her, the following year is when the second biological male started running in Connecticut, and I started speaking to anyone who would talk to me. So I started doing similar things, again, to, to what's been done with Leah Thomas. You know, I um, started writing letters to the Athletic Association in Connecticut, and um, I started reaching out to women's rights groups, um, Title IX attorneys and advocates, uh, trying to get help for the girls in Connecticut. Um, I spoke with lawmakers, uh, state lawmakers, federal lawmakers. I wrote letters. I called the Office of Civil Rights in Boston, and I called the state Title IX coordinator. I, I, I tried everything I could think of um, to get help for the girls. And none of that worked. Um, so it was really hard, and we felt pretty alone. Um, you know, Selena's mom had started a petition, so I know that's another thing that you know I heard about the you know the petition that's been filed, um, certainly on a much larger scale than what we were able to do in Connecticut, but so many similar ideas, um, so many similar things to what we tried, and none of that worked uh, in our case. So it was hard. Uh, you felt pretty helpless as a mom watching your daughter and all the other girls. Um, they were completely disrespected and disregarded by yeah. everyone in charge, right? All the officials, um, the people at the Connecticut Athletic Conference, um, just completely disregarded. They, they were laser focused on making sure that the male athletes were okay and there wasn't even a second thought given to what all these girls were going through. And they were told to be quiet and be good sports and not speak up. Um, there was a real effort in Connecticut to silence anyone who did try and come to their yep. aid. Um, you know, there were a few coaches who did some interviews and that was immediately shut down. Uh, the Connecticut Human Rights Office issued you know, a statement that anyone who was seen even questioning this policy would be um, would be considered to be discriminating against people on the basis of gender identity. So that was shut down really quickly. Um, there was a gender committee formed so that if you reached out to, like I reached out to the Connecticut High School Coaches Association, they couldn't help. They just said, you just have to talk to the gender committee. And so anytime you tried to get help, you were just referred to this gender committee. Um, so it was, it was hard to uh, feel like you couldn't do anything. Um, Chelsea, like she said, she went through this year after year after year, as did all of the girls in Connecticut. Everybody's at a different level, right? Everybody's got their own goals. So some girls are just trying to make it to the finals of the 100 meter dash, or some girls are trying to get to the state open, or maybe place in the top three. You know, for her, she, by the time she got to that junior year, she was hoping to win a state championship and to have that taken from her. Um, you know, she wanted the banner in the gym with her name on it. She wanted all of those things that come, that sort of sense of self and pride and being good at something and being a state champion, she wanted that. And it was hard um, to see that taken from her. So. As I said, I, I looked for help in a lot of places. Um, we were so blessed to be connected with Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, we are so grateful for them. Um, they have really come alongside us and stood beside these girls when no one else would. Um, so for that, we're grateful. And uh, yeah. Thank you. So has, Chelsea, have you, did you have to testify? Like, did you, how did the court can you tell us a little bit about being part of litigation as someone who's... I believe I submitted written testimony. I have not, like, um, personally testified since there hasn't been any litigation, really. Okay. And go ahead. I'll let you add. So to just to clarify, so because the court 
basically dismissed their case and said that their lost opportunities and records didn't matter. We went right up to the Court of Appeals without having a trial. So, so okay. far, they've only, as she said, submitted written declarations. And as of right now, this is the only case where women are suing, right? That's right. So are you hoping to submit other lawsuits? Are, I mean, how, are you, how do you go about it? Seem, that seems crazy that there are more lawsuits the other direction trying to undo the laws protecting women and girls than there are lawsuits of women trying to defend their right and access to fair treatment, respect, and fair competition. How do you propose or how do you foresee Increasing those, do you, maybe Nancy can speak to this. Do, do you have other people that you're speaking with? Are there other people interested in filing lawsuits? How do, is it a lack of funds? Is it a lack of connections? I know women feel strongly about this. Is I just don't know if it's maybe not knowing what to do next. Yeah, no, I'm happy to jump in and then Nancy sure as well. So I would say first and foremost, it's certainly not a lack of funds. So Alliance Defending Freedom represents all of our clients for free period, end of story. We pay for everything. So it's really, it's really, a, it's our honor and privilege to represent these courageous female athletes. And we would love to see more cases filed. Um, I think there's great opportunity here, especially for those who have lost in direct competition to a male athlete, especially those who have been bumped down in placements, who have lost advancement opportunities, um, certainly those championship titles and so forth. But those are going to be among some of the very strongest cases to bring. And I want to say, while we, we haven't quite gotten to this yet, Jim, and I think we are going to, um, I think... I think we need to try to go after the NCAA on this one. I think there's great opportunity to pursue universities who are failing to provide protected categories for their female athletes. To go after Ivy League, for example, which again, failed its female competition. And certainly the NCAA, who has certainly abdicated the field completely as it re relates to protecting female athletics. One th just one quick comment more on that, Kim. As a litigator, I would much prefer to be the one choosing jurisdictions to sue in and fact patterns. We're in a much stronger position when we're the ones bringing the lawsuit versus responding to one. Because you may notice, especially for those of you who are lawyers in the crowd, that the ACLU challenged the Save Women's Sports Law in the Fourth Circuit, West Virginia, and recently in Indiana, the Seventh Circuit. Why? Because there's more favorable precedent that they think they can twist to their favor. I'd like to be suing, suing in other circuits that actually have more favorable precedent that's going to more accurately interpret Title IX according to its original meaning. Again, ultimately optimistic that the Supreme Court will rule in the right direction on this, but we'd love to get some circuit splits going, and that, that takes all of us. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, I think what we need is a class action case, right? Not just to have it be on just a few, but to have enough NCAA athletes come forward about, say, Aaliyah Thomas or something, right, to be able to make that case. Um, it's not quite so clear as to be able to sue the NCAA. There was a case, as you know, about that says that um, the NCAA doesn't itself receive the federal funds, right, and under Title IX. Um, but yeah, yeah, but there's there's a, an, there's another theory sh saying that uh, schools have ceded authority over to the schools. I just want you to notice just the profound sexism of really not caring what happens to women's sports. The way that I just can't believe that they would if it was men's sports. And two is there's no caring about <clears throat> trans men, female bodies, trans men um, who, who want to be able to play sports. They're only looking at one direction of, right? They're not looking at this as what can we do for trans people? It's all about what can we do to include trans men in sports? And you know those anyway. So so the, we, we do. We're always in contact with um, people that want to sue. But like you said, you know, we've got to make sure it's the right place and the right time. Can I just add to that, Kim, really quickly? So Nancy's exactly right. The Supreme Court, under one theory, said, "Hey, NCAA, 
you're not subject to Title IX. Craziness, right? It did, though, leave open other theories and possible avenues. So I don't want to. I don't want to make any mistake by promising that there's a clear Title IX hook here for the NCAA. There isn't. I think there are some golden opportunities to test those legal theories and see what we can accomplish. But ladies, what we can accomplish in federal court, we may not even be able to measure what we would accomplish advocacy-wise and in, frankly, scaring potentially the NCAA into doing the right thing. Right now, athletic organizations, who do they fear? They're afraid of lawsuits from the ACLU and the male athletes. We need to flip that. Why are they not afraid of lawsuits from female athletes whose rights are being denied them, who are being forced into unfair and unsafe competition? We've got to flip that paradigm. And yes, that may entail bringing some lawsuits that may not ultimately succeed, but we may succeed in the court of public opinion in a way that could have impacts far beyond what the litigation itself could. What you just hit on is something I've thought quite a bit about when um, we've heard from Dr. Tucker and others who have spoken with governing bodies of sport or even um, policymakers and lawmakers that they're afraid of litigation. And I have thought, what, only from one side? <laughs> Why are they not afraid of how women are going to respond? So I do think I, somehow we have got to garner the courage to reach out to the people who will defend us in courts and say, hey, we're not going to stand for this and just sit tight. Um, I've spoken with Nancy quite a bit about how this, as she was saying, is so one-sided. I really don't think this would be up for discussion if when women injected testosterone, if they were able to take over the NFL and Major League Baseball and the NBA. Um, because the men would say, this is unfair, and it's going to stop now. And I think it's, it, it's an interesting point that if we became superhuman in some way, by superhuman over all of humanity, by changing our biology or our hormone levels superficially, that women would there would be some way to keep women out of power. But right now, the conversation is only a way to keep women even out of the fields where they have been able to find success in the last 50 years. So it is going to take, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I invited Chelsea and her mom to come speak on this panel, is going to take these young women of steel, and I commend her for, and the others that are involved in this lawsuit for, having the courage to take this stand. Nancy, you want to add something to that? Yeah, and again, let me refer back to my earlier slides. We are not, we are dealing with a world where, number one, it's a zero-sum game, okay? It's, it's either Chelsea or, or the, the, right? So, and, and just how truncated the opportunities are for women over, right? So there, we're already in the high school space where she was 1.3 million behind. That means she didn't have a lacrosse team to go to. She didn't have a soccer team to go to or whatever, I don't know what sports that her particular school is offering. But <clears throat> they're, they're not offering anywhere near as many opportunities as they are for boys. And until you connect and make, and Women have got to be the ones to make it happen. There's no, the, the, our Office for Civil Rights is not going to be enforcing this. It is, until we get to private litigation, University of Iowa never would have started women's wrestling without him. So I just can't stress, we're, we're talking about having this influx of people who were, it's this unfair advantage into a field where we're already way behind what, where we should be. We're $1.18 billion in college scholarships, and people are okay with that. This is 50 years after the law. Until women are ready to sue, it's not going to happen. Fabulous. Okay, so now I want to um, have Jim share his story. I'll come back to Chelsea and Christy um, at the end after we have listened to Jim. But this is a really positive story 
about what can happen when women decide they've had enough and the law is on our side. So with that, will you please, Jim, share your story? Uh, well, thank you. I uh, want to establish a baseline for what happened at Iowa by telling you a little bit about our history at Iowa and the relationship to female sports because I think we were able to establish a narrative and connect with our public by, the, the word isn't shaming, but it comes close to it. Can we at least be as good as our history? And let me explain. First of all, I'm sitting next to two people who spent some part of their life in Iowa City. Uh, Nancy was there as a very young uh, girl when her father was taking uh, sur uh, training as a physician. Uh, and Kim grew up there. We went to the same high school. I'm elevated by sitting next to them. I, I'm not their stature as athlete or, or otherwise, but I share this in common with in Iowa. I do think that uh, respecting young girls as athletes has to do uh, with the DNA of the upper Midwest and even go further and say that it tends to be a smaller town in rural value. I don't know the reasons for it, probably original settlement patterns. I think also on the farm, if there's a bale of hay to be lifted, it doesn't matter whether you're the boy or the girl, <laughs> you, you stick to it. And these are expectations. But going way back to the 1920s in Iowa, we had a robust uh, high school athletic for girls program in place. These were entertainment as well as social cultural events. Uh, they established in that period of time an athletic union for girls that was independent of the males. By the 1950s, they had statewide basketball tournaments in Des Moines that were telecast into eight states. This preceded the imagination of men in any state. Uh, and it was against this background and expectation, however, that when females came to the universities, they were shunted. There was not a way to express it. They had strong intramural programs, had strong club sports, but they weren't integrated into the Big Ten. Uh, this, this had to happen later. But you had this fertile ground uh, to grow on when Title IX was passed. It was intuitive. We had a progressive university president, Willard Boyd. His reaction to the passage of Title IX was to appoint two athletic directors to serve uh, together, uh, one for women, Christine Grant, a pioneer in Title IX, the other, uh, Bump Elliott, an absolutely superb human being and genuinely progressive on these issues. And the two of them together began to grow the University of Iowa and be a model for the nation. Sports Illustrated sent a team of reporters in 1973 to Iowa. The, the thesis of the article was, how do we get this done? Title IX, when people began to discover that it involved athletics, it was a question a lot of states who had no tradition, how do we do this? And so at least one place to look was the state of Iowa. So you can say for the first 10, 15 years of Title IX that Iowa was at the cutting edge, imperfect, but at the cutting edge of, of progress for the promotion of women's sports. Uh, something happened, and this is a part of the story, and I want to tell you how some of the deceptions uh, that we uncovered at Iowa with the help of our experts, Nancy and her colleagues, uh, but it was not just peculiar to Iowa, it's going on throughout the country, but when you compare these tactics or strategies or practices against what I consider to be Iowa's progressive heritage, it made uh, the relief so stark that at a certain point you could feel the public opinion changing with respect to our lawsuit and gave us a great deal of power to end up with a resolution that I think set a precedent that might be worth looking at. So w what happened at Iowa was that with a lot of other universities, in fact, their rhetoric was so similar, I suspected that they'd all been on the same Zoom call. Uh, uh, the, it was in reaction to COVID, in reaction to announcements that they would be not having big athletic events, football and otherwise, and I think their fiscal concerns were based in fact. But I also think, and this happened in a lot of other parts of society, COVID became the excuse where those who had power to accelerate changes that they wanted to see uh, that benefited them. And I think university collegiate athletics was one of those areas where this happened. Already disproportionate power within the male sports, most of them headed by males whose background and alliances with the big sports, football, basketball, otherwise. But suddenly you had, after the students were brought back in August, 
uh, four sports uh, team members were called to a private meeting. Uh, one was women swimming and diving, to their ultimate regret, uh, but also smaller men's teams, gymnastics, tennis, and swimming, called to a special meeting without any uh, pre-knowledge, and then locked in a room, an announcement made, you guys were being terminated, and the athletic director said, uh, because of budgetary concerns, if you have any questions, ask these people, and left the room and started working the press. Uh, so these students were trapped in the room, their parents were hearing about it through the news media, because all this thing was uh, allowed. If they'd made this announcement in the summer, of course, these students could have begun to organize, uh, and, and the public, but that was the plan. You found other universities within the Big Ten and also around the country. If you were attentive to the language that was being used, you could feel it was, there was something there. So I think there are any number of student, uh, these sports that were on the target for a period of time, and they were cut on the, on the uh, cutting room floor. So when these students who had nothing, and I think this is also a part of the litigation strategy and excuse things, as much many compliments as I've played uh, paid to the federal judiciary, and I s firmly believe that, there's also a skewing, and that is to say there's so much at risk by taking on the establishment that it usually becomes the case where there's nothing left to lose that you become litigants, right? It's the teams that are cut. What else do they do? For those who are trying to mediate somewhere in between, the risks that they feel are real. I'm not mitigating it, but it means that the fact patterns that we have are disproportionately arising from a situation in which a team has been cut. And then what are the rights of these people? Universities know that because to the extent that universities have sometimes succeeded, they have their plan in effect. Okay, how do we defend this cut? On the other hand, if you're plaintiffs, you're suddenly caught unaware and you're deciding what to do with your life. And these students have all kinds of huge burdens. You know, can I go somewhere else and complete my career? The, the life of an athlete at a competitive stage is very short. And if you've gone to university, you've picked a place you want to be with your friends, you've picked coaches. In some of these sports, it's quite an intimate uh, decision. And uh, uh, so people are uh, trying to make hard decisions. Well, the basis then, we have swimmers who need a place. They had been meeting, Nancy been rattling them up the way that she does when she goes into town. I also had some people uh, coming to me and we were ready to go and we, we combined these uh, uh, forces. So w what you have is a plaintiff. One, you need, I had 10 swimming and diving members come and meet in my office. And when I laid out what was there, I said, go home and talk to your parents. Don't make any decisions. I was left with four. And I, I hold nothing against the six. They had very good reasons for not uh, going uh, forward. Some of them went to other schools to swim, but they did not uh, want to be risking that they would be named as a litigator, right? The four that were there uh, were, were brilliant and, and wonderful. As the plaintiff's lawyer, I get to choose who the lead plaintiff is. I want that person's name to follow. It'll always be named Sage Olenshalen. Why did I name Sage? Uh, one, she had been a walk-on to Iowa. She had a time that was good enough to be considered. She didn't get a scholarship. And by the time she walked in my office, she'd been elected by her peers as the team captain. I thought that was a wonderful thing. Two, she aspired to be a lawyer. She was articulate. I thought she would take an interest in the case as we uh, progressed. So I had, I had four uh, litigants, and later on we added two more, and I'll tell you why in a moment. I needed access to experts, and this is where Nancy was invaluable. I could not have sorted through what was there. I ended up with a better group than what we had, and we wanted to move fast. As a plaintiff's lawyer, you need to have confidence in your data. And if you don't have that, you have to slow things down in order to get what data that you need. And in this case, uh, uh, in addition to Nancy's work, she told you a minute ago about a letter that she'd written to the different conferences. One of them was to the Big Ten. And those letters were copied to each university president. Before I even started, I had Exhibit A. Uh, it doesn't put a university in very favorable light to have received an accurate letter describing deficiencies in Title IX. And for the history of that letter to be, it was completely ignored. That's where we started. And that's what the press got through my uh, various channels. And the first thing they're asking the university is, why didn't you answer this letter? Did you get a letter? Fine, I like to start things on the offensive. Uh, two, uh, with Nancy's cohorts, uh, and, and I'll briefly describe what the databases are, they could tell me in fairly good order that the problem with the University of Iowa, of course, we were facing the press saying, well, we're in compliance with Title IX. We had an investigation a few years ago, and they cleared us, OCR cleared us. At some point, we'll talk about why that clearance doesn't mean very much. 
But as a plaintiff's lawyer, you're not certain. But with the data that we had, it was clear that Iowa was out of compliance in terms of uh, athletic pr participation numbers. It was robust, and it went on for 20 years. Donna Lopiano is a brilliant advocate uh, and a pedigree that no one really can compare, I think, no one that I've met, uh, 50 years of advocacy for women's athletics. And she puts together, she works with Christine Gallus, another uh, very accomplished Title IX lawyer. And I had data in front of me soon that led me to believe that I could make very strong allegations and never have to back away. And so we went on the offensive. And I felt that the number of discrepancies with the University of Iowa between what they were obligated under Title IX to provide in terms of athletic opportunities, that means varsity uh, positions in terms of scholarships and other things, was big enough and long-lasting enough. I had a great deal of confidence that we could uh, do more than just reinstate the team. And what I thought we ought to do was take that, that difference and expand it and increase numbers of athletic opportunities. Again, working through Nancy and other channels, found two young women who were willing to serve as plaintiffs who represented emerging sports. One was the senior, a very neat lady, a philosophy major, articulate. She was captain of the women's rugby team. Two, uh, a woman who had wrestled in high school. There was just a growing interest in wrestling at the high school level. Most of these girls, as I call them girls in high school, women as, uh, as university students, as a girl tried to express this interest in wrestling, she did sue by wrestling with uh, boys teams but had come to the university and found nowhere to express that interest. Those two individuals became co-plaintiffs in a case where we now had multiple plaintiffs and a litigation strategy that we weren't just going to win on the reinstatement of the women's team, but we were going to force the university to do something that was in its interest once they recognized it to expand women's sports opportunities. Each state is different. Iowa is wired in this weird way that we are a state of small town wrestling fanatics. We love the idea of sharp elbows planted on each other's ears that give people cauliflower ears. Uh, I don't understand the sport. I wasn't tough enough to do it, but I know that it's there. And so uh, we have icons. The icons in our state are people like Dan Gable, Tom Brands. These, these are people who, who surpass any, all the rest of us in terms of uh, the iconic legends. legends. Legends in our own time, and we all feel this way because of their performance in the, in the sport of wrestling. So using the data from Donna Lopiano to prove that the, the gap was significant and more than the 36 women swimming team members who had been removed, it was multiples of that, and gave us an opportunity in the end to encourage them, and they adopted uh, uh, our premise, and they committed to establishing a world I mean, a women's wrestling program. Now, as a me measure of the success, after all this pushing back, no, no, we're in compliance, no, no, you can't tell us what to do. Uh, about 10 months ago, at, at Iowa, when University of Iowa wrestles the men, uh, Penn State and others, 14,000 people come to the arena to watch. It's a screaming deal. And uh, at the, the time that they met at the University of Iowa, they broke the action long enough to introduce uh, the new women's wrestling coach. A standing ovation for five minutes. They couldn't quiet the crowd, so they just went ahead and started wrestling against before the crowd got quiet. This kind of synergy and uh, energy means that Iowa, in other ways, desperately trying to reconnect to the rural and small town Iowa, which is a part of our culture, have done so in one fell swoop. Uh, the energy that's created at the high school level as the possibility of maybe wrestling at a university, but more important, reaffirmed that if I want to wrestle, it's an okay thing. Just the signal that Iowa, University of Iowa, the first uh, uh, major conference university to adopt a women's wrestling program, uh, this sets the table. So when they had this spring, a statewide meet for women, girl wrestlers for high school, 600 people came to the meet and Dan Gable was the keynote speaker. You can change and adapt to a culture. Again, my view was we were trying to reestablish ourselves to Iowa's uh, history in a positive way. But these kinds of things, compliance with Title IX is uh, not a burden. Uh, it, it's not a zero sum. It's, 
it's an opportunity for a university to do the right thing, to comply with the law, to give women opportunities that the law requires, but also to make, uh, make the university a better place. There's no downside to that. Well, sorry to talk so long. I'd be glad to answer a question if we have time. Yeah. I was really excited to have Jim share that story for a number of reasons. But I think one of the big things I want you all to take away from hearing that is just that women's sports, I mean, for us here, and, and for those listening and so many people I know that wanted to be here in person but couldn't make it, women's sports is part of the fabric of our culture in the United States. And honestly, around the world, women have become a massive part of the every four years Olympics celebration. Our professional sports are just beginning to boom. This is something I believe a lot of people think should become a boon to new business and, and to the young girls looking up. So I love the idea that the fabric and culture of our society supports women's sports. There's not anyone that doesn't think they should exist. If they do, I don't know them. <laughs> I don't want to know them. There you go. So I think this is part of what we're looking for, for the heartbeat behind an organization like ICONS, is to say, we deserve fair treatment, we want fair treatment, but this is something to celebrate. Female athletes, their greatness, their potential, what this can do for the world, how it can unite us and bring us together, is something to celebrate. This is not about hurting anyone. We want everyone to have access to sports, but we cannot let women be thrown under the bus and hurt in that process. So boiling this down, this is an exciting story because the University of Iowa cut a bunch of their women's sports programs and a bunch of women said, no, you're not gonna do this to us, we're gonna take it to the courts. The facts are on their side, and the courts came back and said, not only do you need to reinstate this program that you cut, you need to add more opportunity. And the culture of the entire state where this was done got behind them, celebrated it, recognized it, and it became a positive for the university. And I hope that when, as we, you know, this is the last day of this conference, and as we wrap this up, we can take that positive message and realize that being Litigious is sometimes looked at as a negative thing, but when you are defending what's right and you've got the public support behind you, as we do, and we recognize women's value to society, it's not a bad thing to do. And these are the kind of people who are behind you. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> so. Um, I do want to hear from Chelsea one more time to close this panel, and then we'll open up for a couple of questions. And Chelsea, my question for you is, how do you feel now being part of a lawsuit that's been going on for two years? Are you proud of yourself? Do you hear from other women? Are other people proud of you? Has there been an evolution in the conversations that you've had? Please share with us. Yeah, I mean, I'm super grateful to be here um, and to you and Marshy for setting this up. I mean, it's great to see so many um, just women coming together on this issue. I mean, like two years ago, even you know, five years ago when I started in high school, there really was no one um, you know, championing this issue and making us feel supported and like we were being heard. So it's great to have everyone here um, supporting us. It means a lot to me and Cicely and I know. Um, um, I have received, you know, a lot of support from other female athletes, you know, my friends, family, um, all of you guys. Um, there is a lot of quiet support, I would say, a lot of female athletes um, unsure of, you know, you know, they'll tell me in private um, that they support me, but won't openly or publicly speak in support of this issue. Um, I also know female athletes that do not support this issue, which is very shocking to me. Um, but I would not change any of that. I know I made the right decision um, two years ago to come public with this. I know my story has inspired a lot and has, um, you know, with all the legislation that has been brought to states, it has helped inspire that. So I'm very, um, you know, proud of myself for doing that. And I, kn I knew it was going to be very hard, and it has been hard at points to, you know, deal with the... I don't want to say like repercussions, but I mean backlash of the um, 
opposition, but um, I know personally what I experienced was wrong, and I want other females that have gone through this and will go through this until it's rectified to know that they do have a voice and they should use that voice and that I think their story matters. I don't, you know, whether you lost um, a state championship or you lost out on, you know, qualifying, every loss matters. Like, you should have been there. Um, I, that matters to me. I know that matters to my mom. It matters to everyone here. So no matter what, you, you matter to me. Um, we deserve <laughs> fair opportunities. Thank you so much. I do... Uh, Christy wrote me a couple sentences. I'm, I'll, Nancy, I'll let you say something. But Christy wrote me a couple sentences that I want to read off. When I asked, I was trying to get some guidelines on what kind of questions to ask at this discussion on panel. Um, and I, I asked her, what were you hoping for, for your daughter, on behalf of your daughter? And I think what she wrote, and I'm sure she doesn't have it written in front of her, and I hope it's okay if I read this out loud. So I was hoping it would stop it from happening to anyone else. Um, oh gosh. It was hard to watch our story play out all over again this winter on an even bigger stage. We had hoped that the larger sports community, professional athletes, coaches, sports journalists, and women would come together and speak up for athletes and for our girls. That didn't happen, but I believe it's starting to happen now. And I think that's a word of encouragement. Thank you. Do you want yeah, to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just closing, I want to say that um, on our website, just like uh, just Christy here, we we have um, a lot of athletes who have already been through this process, right? Who have already uh, right, and they talk about what an amazing experience it was, and they go in with a lot of fears, and they come out on the other side being so proud of what it is that they've done. So to see that metamorphosis and see the, like the change that you see in people as they really stand up for themselves, it's amazing, number one. Number two is, you know, we have a petition that we put together and it ended up being like 177 pages. It's 7,600 people. It's 400 Olympians, Paralympians, national and Olympic coaches, um, and uh, national team members. It's 1,221 coaches. The sports community is behind us. The reason why uh, women... And that's sports for one sport, by the way. Yeah. Well, we, um, so, A little so, more. So, so, yeah, so we reached out to our swimming database, but it, tr it, it made its way around, so oh, okay. we had so many other sports from all over the world, Sim. Um yeah, it was it was telling USA Swimming at the time, but we broadened it to to tell sports organizations to prioritize fairness for girls and women in sports. When they came up with their eligibility policies for who should be in, prioritize fairness. And if they follow the science, that's where they're going to be. <clears throat> um, I always have to remind myself that I used to think that you know you know, of course we would have inclusion. And um, I was told one year of gender-affirming hormones would move somebody laterally, that they would move from 500th place to 500th place. Okay, so now we know, if you heard all day yesterday, that's not true. And so with that new information, I changed how it is that I think about fairness and how I think about the issue in general. I know that it's just, there's no way that you can make somebody um, a, a new testosterone level means that they should be competing in the women's category. But we all got together, the Women's Sports Policy Working Group, um, specifically because one of our icons, Martina Navratilova, was really getting killed, was really getting a lot, and we had to have her back. Martina Navratilova has done so much for women in sports for lesbian in sports, for the LGB com community, she has been phenomenal. So the, when we all got together, me, Donna Deverona, Donna Lopiano, um, um, and uh, Tracy Sundlin, he runs the, inter the Interscholastic High School National Championships. Um, when, when we all got together, uh, 
we knew that we had each other's backs. So I don't agree with some people politically here. I, I know not everybody believes in transgender, that there is such a thing. I do. Um, but we've got to have each other's backs. We've got to help each other. Yep. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I know this is Title IX focused, but one thing we noticed with a lot of the Save Women's Sports Bills is that they weren't all the same. And so I just was hoping that some of you could talk about the things that need to be included in those bills, especially in the case of like South Carolina, where there was a House bill and a Senate bill, both called Save Women's Sports. But unlike the Senate bill, the House bill didn't require the use of unaltered birth certificates and didn't cover collegiate sports. And there was also a Delaware bill that allowed girls to elect to be on the men's team if they didn't have a female sport for them. So could you just mention a few things we, that make Christiana, a good bill? Christiana, you want to take yeah. this one? I, I'm just wondering how you feel about this because, um, you know, as the mother of three girls and three athletes, opportunities for them to participate on male teams have, were critical to their athletic development. And I, one of my problems with some of the state level bills um, is that they don't allow women to do that. And so the problem is women are the underrepresented sex. Women are the ones who have fewer opportunities. And when there's no male ice hockey team you know, at our public high school, the ability to play on that ice hockey team for the girls who are ice hockey players is really important. So I want to make sure that those bills don't close off opportunities for no, women. Good question. And yeah. so I'm wondering how you feel. Yeah, yeah. Happy to, happy to address that first, and then don't let me forget. Um, so you're, you're correct. They're not all identical. Um, some, I would say, I supported more strongly than others. The vast majority of them only prohibit males from competing on the women's team. So the vast majority of them still make it it's still perfectly acceptable for young women to compete on the men's team if they choose, and certainly acceptable to have co-ed teams. So I'm I can't think, frankly, of a state at this off the top of my head that would prohibit a female, except maybe Texas. There may have been some Texas legislation. Yes, that may have prohibited the girls from competing on the boys' team. That's not something I would support. Um, I think there's very clear reasons for fairness and safety that man, men should not be on women's teams, but those concerns do not go the other direction. As for your question, um, there are three things that I'm generally looking for in a Save Women's Sports Bill. Number one, a clear declaration that the women's sports team is only for biological females. Number two, it must include collegiate athletics. I think we're doing our female athletes in college a great disservice when these states do not have the courage to cover collegiate athletics. Um, there was a lot of conversation early on, especially in the 2020, 2021 legislative season, that, oh my gosh, we're gonna be violating NCAA policy. That's false. The NCAA prior policy simply stated that you did not turn a female team into a co-ed team by allowing a male who had been suppressing his testosterone for a year to compete on that team. It never affirmatively required universities and colleges to do so. They were allowed to make up their own policy. So number two, it's imperative that you protect collegiate athletic women. Number three, it's also imperative to have a private right of action clearly stated. We don't want to leave that, generally speaking, um, and the lawyers can, can address this as well, you don't have a right to sue over every law that's designed to protect you. Generally speaking, you need to have that clearly articulated within the statute or the courts need to state, as they have done in Title IX, that there's a private right of action. So if you want to give some, some heft to a legal protection, if you want to ensure that female athletes can say, hey, this is wrong and I need to hold my school district or athletic association accountable, there needs to be included a private right of action. So those are the three things I'm looking for in every state-level bill.